think it was very strategic for this talk to follow Mila's because she gave a great uh, sort of baseline understanding of a little bit about what we'll be talking about today, which is how research can play a role in AI-powered experiences. So it's sort of the opposite perspective uh, as the data science that she was uh, presenting about. So uh, this is a picture from my apartment. And this is just to point out that I have somewhat of a non-traditional background in like my exposure to machine learning. Um, I have this cookbook collection, and there's like 200 or so, and it's still growing. It's been growing for a number of years. Um, but it was actually in 2015 that I bought this one. It just looked interesting. It's called Cognitive Cooking with Chef Watson. So has anyone heard of this book before? OK, see some hands. So Chef Watson. Uh, is not a real chef. <laughs> chef Watson is actually an AI chef that is built on top of IBM Watson's technology. Um, and so Chef Watson is actually trained on, it's an AI model that's trained on around 9,000 recipes from Bon Appetit magazine. Um, it also takes into account flavor combinations, you know, food chemistry, different sorts of compounds. And Chef Watson uses algorithms to recommend these really unique recipe combinations. Um, it even gives you things like proportions, you know, instructions. It's giving you the whole thing. And I thought, hey, this is kind of a cool cookbook. Uh, this is really my first time learning about machine learning. Here's an example of a recipe that Watson recommends. So an Indian turmeric paella. It sounds really interesting, right? It's sort of this biryani type thing. It's combining, you know, a lot of different influences, it's putting ingredients together, it's saying, you know, rice, paella, sort of a similar uh, overlap there, and it looks really, really good. So in practice, though, <laughs> Watson's not always as good as you hope it's going to be. So this is an Amazon review that says, great book, but mostly terrible food. So I'll just read this. The recipes are mostly terrible, but the stories are phenomenal. You'll probably only want to try out one or two recipes but the stories of Watson that go along with the recipes make this entirely worthwhile. So again, a cookbook with pretty terrible food, but amazing stories about Watson. And I think uh, I can attest to that. You know, pretty amazing introduction to, to AI. Uh, and this person actually gave five stars. So if you have any questions about the accuracy of Amazon reviews, uh, here you go. So here's a second review. Interesting but impractical for the gainfully employed. So interesting menus and ingredient combinations, but practically all recipes will take either a full day or multiple days to prepare. Would suggest buying something else if the intent is to use the recipes. <laughs> this person a little more accurate with three stars. Again, this is for a cookbook. So uh, you know, kind of interesting, but you can't actually use these recipes. This is a flavor combination that Watson recommends. So we have a Bloody Mary and mayonnaise. And on paper, you can sort of see why this makes sense, right? Tomatoes and mayonnaise. Uh, BLT sandwich, probably a pretty uh, popular combination on the recipes that Watson learned from. Um, you know, on paper, though, it's not really a great combo. We know that this is probably disgusting to drink. It's goopy. It's, yeah, the texture is totally off. So Watson has been most successful when it, you actually pair the technology with actual humans. So these are chefs from the Institute of Culinary Education. And Watson here is providing these amazing combinations of flavors that you know, they're not thinking of, you might not necessarily expect. And it's the actual chefs that are taking things like technique, culinary tradition. You know, is this a French recipe? Is this Caribbean? Like, Where should we be inspired from? Uh, they're thinking about things like texture that Watson doesn't really understand. And it's this combination of Watson with the real chefs that makes this super powerful. So I want to talk a little bit about examples from a different field uh, of where AI, on its own, is a little questionable. So this is actually the cover of a novel. And there's a number of people who have uh, trained their AI models on all these tens of thousands of science fiction books from Project Gutenberg. And they actually have these uh, AI models create new books mimicking the language and the style of these science fiction books. Um, the AI even makes the author's name, the title, the description that you find on Amazon, and the cover. 
And so if you've never seen AI art before, uh, it generally looks like this, a little creepy. So this is Fukushima Flowers. Uh, here's a description of one of those books you can buy on Amazon. This is called The Table in 10 by Stope Freeze. And again, this is all generated by the AI. Alone with his vital decades of president, both Rumen's born as a fascinating woman who is drawn back into her own need for a family's jacketor, not sure where that word comes from, to see who has struggles to cooperate while willing to accept one of her committed lovers, return to the neighborhood, and Luke tries to take a job in Pete. <laughs> so again, pretty cool in theory, right, but not exactly uh, satisfying. And another example of an AI written novel, there was a student at NYU, New York University, uh, named Ross Goodwin. And a few years ago, he had this idea to recreate Jack Kerouac's On the Road, which, if you're not familiar, is a really famous uh, American novel about someone taking a road trip, and it's something you read like growing up in high school or something. So Ross Goodwin took this vehicle and equipped it with four sensors a camera, a GPS, a microphone, and a clock. And he actually fed all of the data as he was recreating this road trip into this AI system that he had trained on you know, tens of thousands of books, uh, all of the Foursquare location data, like reviews and stuff like that, which combined with GPS and images. And so this is an you know, incredible undertaking. And you can actually buy this book. Um, it's online. I haven't read it, but I'm sure it's entertaining. It's called One the Road, the number one. Um, and again, as you might expect, this is something that's been recognized for its accomplishment and its ingenuity, not necessarily the quality of the writing. So here's a review of One the Road from Bomb Magazine. There is an inescapable and perhaps unhelpful urge to find a pattern in its loose grasp of grammar and lottery word choice. Because of this linguistic tick, sentences that read more or less as normal, like the opener, are applauded as one would do with a toddler. <laughs> and it's very hard to follow, even the excerpts. So in the example of Chef Watson and you know, the AI novels, it's kind of begging the question of like, why weren't the results better? Right? Humans, as opposed to machines, use intuition and inference when we make decisions. Uh, take rock climbing, for example. You know, people say rock climbing is an art. It's a combination of intuition, inference, it's just feel, right, feel and judgment. Uh, these are the things that make climbing a wall like this possible. Um, and these are exactly the types of human reasoning skills and emotions that AI doesn't really recognize. When we leave everything up to an algorithm or to an AI system, things have the potential to go pretty wrong. Um, Technology doesn't really understand what it's doing or this larger context and why it's doing these things. And you know, in the case of the novels, that's not a big deal. But in cases of self-driving cars, for instance, that actually is a really big deal. So there's a chief decision scientist at Google named Cassie Kozarkov. And she actually has this brilliant metaphor where she, combines, uh, she compares AI to an island full of drunk people, which is here. <laughs> And so on this island, you know, imagine instead of this AI that's making decisions for you and making predictions, it's actually all just this island of drunk people. And they learn everything that they know by examples. So let's say you want to know whether you know, a movie is one that you're going to like, or you're kind of looking for something to watch. What are all the movies that I should watch right now? Uh, everyone on this island has studied all the movies that I've watched in the past. The thing is, though, that they're all drunk. And so they can't be blindly trusted to give me a recommendation of anything that I'm going to like all the time, right? Sometimes it could be wrong. A lot of times it's, uh, you know, sometimes it could be right as well. These people on the island, even though they've studied all these past examples, don't really know if I've liked a movie that I've watched. They don't really understand what it is about movies that I've liked that make me like them. Um, you know, they have a really incomplete information. And it's this exact issue that drives services like Netflix to explain why it's recommending certain things to you. Um, so you can see here, maybe you know, of all these movies you liked, it was the fact that anti-heroes and moral ambiguity were part of them, or edgy coming-of-age movies, or even sharp humor and strong female leads. Uh, Netflix is actually giving you that information about why it's recommending certain titles. 
So the point of the drunk island metaphor is that AI can't be relied on with blind faith. We provide feedback, evaluation. We even choose which past examples are included when we make these models. And we incorporate human thought and emotion so that we're designing AI systems that are accurate and fair. So I won't go too deep into this, and Mila did a great job explaining a little bit about AI, but AI is really similar to the drunk people on this island, where they learn by example. Um, there's a few inputs here, data, patterns, and models. And these are the types of things that power Netflix's recommendation system, the Instagram feed, the Facebook news feed, uh, things you might be using on a regular basis. So data is all of these examples of you know, things I've done in the past or movies I've watched in the past. It's taking all of this, and once it has enough, it can start to identify patterns, right? I don't have to say, here's everything I've liked about these movies. Maybe it's picking out a few things, like the sharp sense of humor, and it's creating these examples or these patterns by itself based on these examples. And then models is when you take those patterns and apply them via algorithms to future pieces of content. So it's saying, great, here's what we know, here's the patterns we found, here's like 10 new movies you might want to watch that fit these patterns. Um, and this technology is amazing, right? It's growing every day, it's empowering these experiences all around us. Um, however, in this talk, in the examples we've seen so far, I want to talk about two issues with relying on AI only uh, that are sort of limitations that research can help solve. <clears throat> the first problem is that these tend to prioritize the short term over the long term. So on Instagram, uh, this is a screen you might have seen, someone's profile, and people follow accounts that they like. However, if we're suggesting that we optimize only for getting people to follow other people, you know, which is easily measurable by a computer, uh, people are going to end up with these unmanageably large networks. And these networks are going to be full of people who aren't all equal, right? So of course you're real friends, but you're probably going to be following a lot of friends of friends. You know, maybe your crazy family members find you on Facebook and start following you on Instagram. Maybe your coworkers who you don't want to see part of your personal life follow you on Instagram. Maybe we're suggesting you, you know, connect with acquaintances that you knew in elementary school 15 years ago. Uh, maybe it's full of random people you've met at a conference you were at. There's a lot of ways that this could go. It's not thinking about optimizing for something like usefulness. You know, what does usefulness at staying connected to the right people mean? It's just optimizing for something that's really measurable in the short term. In another example, if Instagram only optimized for the number of comments that people leave, you know, we could be in a world where encouraging really bad quality or harassing content um, that's not actually helpful for people's well-being. And this could really spiral out of control. So that's why there's this system in place that asks you to reconsider leaving a comment that could be perceived by yet another AI system as being negative. And so in the small text here it says, are you sure you want to post this? And there's an undo button. So this is another example of prioritizing something like the long-term health and well-being of the people on the product, not optimizing for, hey, how many comments can we get people to leave on a daily basis? The second problem with relying solely on AI is that these sorts of mental models that we as researchers and designers use to predict how people feel, how they think and act, are not actually represented by a lot of the AI that's just looking at the data and trying to find patterns among what it has available to it to make those predictions. So Chef Watson, right, is optimized for these things. Surprise, it wants these crazy flavor combinations. It's optimized for pleasantness and synergy. Um, and I got those last two from the cookbook, but I'm not exactly sure what they mean. <laughs> the average home cook, however, is optimized, or we know from research that their mental model is a lot more about cleanup. You know, how many dishes am I going to use when I'm making these recipes? Cost, am I going to spend, you know, a day's salary on rare ingredients? And can I even find those ingredients in my local market? And speed, you know, is this going to take multiple days to prepare? This is exactly what we've seen in some of those Amazon reviews, right? Um, so in reality, 
Chef Watson's optimized for things that aren't actually matching the expectations of your average home cook. And you know, there's a disconnect here uh, because it's not taking into account some of these other factors that aren't so obvious in the recipes that it's trained itself on. So user research can be the solution to this, uh, especially when paired with disciplines like data science. We use research all the time, research and design, to investigate these phenomena of long-term versus short-term outcomes, of thinking about people's motivations, their mental models for why they do certain things, how they think about things, how they act. And there's four places where research should have a say in these AI systems. The first one is selecting the right training data. And so that means just making sure that we're including the right examples when we're trying to teach a machine how to think in the first place. The second is calibrating the inputs. So of all the examples that we've included, which ones are most important? Or which factors or features of these examples are the most important things? Three, determining long and short-term success. So thinking about in the short term, right, comments really easy to identify and to have a metric based on, but how are we thinking about well-being in the long term? And then four, improving the model with feedback loops. So building mechanisms to gather more and more research and data over time and to make our models uh, more predictive. So it's actually an iterative cycle. It starts with past data, and as you sort of go around the loop, uh, you're just gathering more and more information, making things more and more precise. And it's research that fits in all over, all throughout this process. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, research and data science have the same shared goal, which is just making the AI more human in the long run. So next we'll talk a little bit about how research uh, actually feeds into this. We'll start with the first two, data and calibrating a model. So research, again, influences that initial data you collect, these examples that teach your computer uh, what you're trying to predict in the long run. And also just figuring out which of these examples or which pieces of, of the example are more important. And mental models really fits in at this phase. So a qualitative research method that helps us map how people think and feel about different things. Um, and since in the long run, run, we want AI to mimic their way of thinking, uh, we should just start a, you know, by building that mental model in the first place so we have this point of reference. So one thing that we try to predict at Instagram is, that makes up a big part of your experience, especially on your feed and in your stories, is interest or interestingness. So in other words, how interesting is this post or this story going to be for you when you come across it? From data, you can guess a lot of these inputs based on how you've interacted with similar content. And this is what an AI would start training itself on. What has this person liked in the past? You know, what have they commented on? Uh, how long do they stare at a piece of media that's on their screen? All of these are really easy for an AI to start collecting on itself and start training itself. And it's possible that these inputs are really accurate and that you have nothing to worry about. You know, on the other hand, it's also possible that these inputs are totally wrong. You know, we know that people like photos, like photos, for a lot of different reasons. This is a pretty sunset, sure, but maybe it's your best friend's 10th post from the past two days of the vacation they're on, and you like it because you feel like, oh, I need to be a good friend. You don't actually have interest. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> You don't actually have interest in the sunset, right? You don't care about, oh, Florida, you know, sunset, amazing. Um, this is a like, but it's not a sign of interest. And this is where our AI can get it wrong. So imagine AI that relies solely on your likes, and you can start to see all the problems that bubble up. Um, and it's actually research that can come to the rescue here. So research can build mental models for both what it means to like something on Instagram, but also, what does it mean to be interested in content? And how are those two things different? So this typically starts with an understanding phase of ethnography. Um, and the benefits here of doing some ethnography are to, one, understand the broader context in which people are using Instagram in the first place, or whatever product you, know, you might have. Um, and then two is observing them in their natural environment. So seeing how they actually go through and use the app itself, and bringing those two things together. You know, we'll walk around with them, go places with participants, uh, kind of just meet their friends even, 
see what places inspire them to create content or maybe when they're really bored where they consume content. Um, we're asking questions like, what does it mean to stay connected to your friends? What is it, you know, how do people differ when they're on their commute and they pull out their phone for 30 seconds between buses or trains and on a Saturday morning when they're in home, you know, at home relaxing in bed for 30 minutes maybe? How does social media play a role in your friend group? You know, do you care about friends from maybe you just moved from another location and those are the friends you care about most? Or maybe it's actually the people who are current and relevant in your life today that are physically in proximity with you that you care about the most. We tie those types of questions back to how people are actually using the product, which we find through usability testing. So imagine, you know, in usability testing, there's a difference between people who open Instagram and just kind of scroll, scroll, scroll. Maybe they stop eventually. Maybe they like, you know, everything they see. Maybe they take their time and they read each caption. They take the time to look at each photo and swipe through each uh, slideshow or carousel. These are all important pieces of context and information for making a mental model of why people are liking and why people are interested in different things. We can even supplement this with additional interviews to probe on our findings, right? We could maybe quantify these with a survey. Um, maybe we've identified five factors that equal interestingness. Let's actually get an idea for how prevalent they are now by serving people on that. These are all pieces of our toolkit that we can be using in this initial phase. The output of this type of work is often a framework. And so the framework could be something like this. It's not an exact one that we use, but you know, great for the purposes of this illustration. So on the y-axis, we have relationship strength. And imagine this is just how close you are to the person who's posting a post or a story. On the x-axis, you have what I call image greatness. So how cool is this thing that they're posting? If you meet a minimum threshold of either being close to someone or being, you know, thinking this is a cool image, you're likely to find that to be an interesting post or an interesting story. If, let's say, it's someone posting something that you're not close to, and the image itself is kind of crappy, maybe you know it's their breakfast this morning, it's gonna be boring probably. And we've learned this through our mental model research. So let's take your best friend, the best friend's gym routine. You might see this in Instagram stories quite a bit. It's your best friend, so really high on this relationship strength, but at the gym doing the same routine as every morning. It's like, why do you keep posting this? You know, the same mirror selfie, uh, lifting, you know, one barbell or whatever, dumbbell. <laughs> um, yeah, but it's your best friend, so you get this, a lot of people would say, oh, well, I want to know what they're doing at any point. You know, that's why I use, like, find my friends so I can see what's my friend doing today at this second. Um, so let's just assume for the cases here that you'll find this interesting. Okay, your cousin's wedding. So it's your cousin, maybe, you know, it's not your first cousin, maybe it's your second cousin's wedding. So it's kind of high on relationship, you know, it's, it's not a stranger, it's your cousin. And it's a wedding, so traditionally a pretty big life moment. Uh, maybe this is something that is sort of a mixture of image greatness and relationship strength, where it's just flat in the middle there and it's gonna be a great post. Here we have a stranger summiting Mount Everest. Uh, a stranger, so someone you have no relationship with, so there's nothing on that axis, but you know, Mount Everest, this is, the greatest thing that I could personally think of for this example, summiting Mount Everest, amazing. And so when we're building these mental models, we've also captured the factors that go into these things, our axes. So when we're talking about what's it mean to be close to someone, is it the fact that they live nearby? Is it that we have a long history together? Or maybe we have a romantic interest. Is it that we have a shared interest that we, you know, we love gaming together? or a shared sense of humor. We send memes to each other all day long. Or maybe it's that we've gone through something together that's united us. For something like image greatness, are we talking about visual quality? Um, is it something that's aspirational? You know, is it great because maybe I wanna climb Mount Everest one day and this is really inspiring to me? Uh, is it the fact that it's totally removed from my experience? Like, I have no exposure to this in the past, so I'm fascinated by it. Um, is it in a remote location, which maybe that fact by itself makes it interesting? Or is it just something you don't often see 
this rarity factor. Some factors like this, we can already tell, are really easy to make into an AI model. So something like unique location or remote location. When an AI is looking at things available to it, it can say, OK, New York City, this person has that tag on their photo. There's a lot of pictures from New York City. Whereas if I have the Mount Everest summit tag on my photo, this is a sign that, hey, this is a really unique location. And imagine that that's the most important thing in our model, showing you things with unique locations, because that's what we understand as interesting. So far, we've taken research and what we know about mental models. We've created these sort of diagrams that, re how, that reveal how people think about uh, factors like interesting. You know, in addition to things like relationship or unique location, maybe it's the fact that it's recent that makes it interesting to you. Or maybe it's the fact that it's viral, the fact that other people like it that makes it interesting to you. These are all things that we can tie back to the data that an AI has available on Instagram itself. From here, though, research can also help by calibrating these things. Maybe we find that actually recency is the most important thing, or virality. The problem that we're you know, coming up against here, though, is that there are factors that an AI system is not going to be able to measure by itself. Something like authenticity. Maybe we learned in our research that authenticity is actually the biggest predictor of interestingness. And you know, that's what we want to train our model on. The question is, how do we get authenticity into this AI when it's not clear? You know, it's, it's a human emotion or a human perception. It's not clear to a machine. This is an opportunity for both quant and qual research. So on Google, for instance, in a search result, you might see a survey asking you, what do you think? This is helpful, hateful, harmful. These are things that an AI is not going to recognize that this sort of human input is going to make clear. On Facebook, maybe you see something asking you, how relevant is this ad? Again, relevancy, if you're not going to purchase something, is really, really hard to detect. On Instagram, imagine you see this survey by a post. How authentic is this post? Very authentic, all the way to not at all authentic. By getting people to complete a survey like this, we're just gathering examples that will eventually train a model to identify what's authentic and not authentic. And we know that authenticity is key for long-term value. We're just scaling what it means to understand authenticity via all these examples that we've been collecting via this survey work. So imagine that you, know, you see this survey, and it's asking you a very simple question. When you scale this via thousands of responses, you can start noticing patterns on your own, right? Maybe you are cutting the data by things like, oh, is it a meme? Is it a post from my friend or a celebrity? Um, how authentic are these different things? How do they compare against each other? This is how an AI starts to think and these patterns begin to emerge based on these pieces of metadata. We can then predict you know, how authentic a post is going to be in the future based on all these examples. Maybe we assign an authenticity metric to each post. This is important for the long-term success, so bringing it back to what we talked about at the beginning. Uh, rather than optimizing for something like likes, we're optimizing for continuous engagement over a long period of time and retention on the platform, finding it useful for showing you what you're actually interested in. And just as a recap, the way we've done this is via surveys uh, that have just sort of gathered this human emotion on many examples of content and spit out predictions in the long run. This is one input into how the Instagram feed could be ranked, right? Maybe we assign an authenticity score to each post and combine that with things like recency and the other factors in our mental model. And this is how it all comes together to actually serve those recommendations in any sort of AI system. The goal is to show you more of the right stuff and less of the wrong stuff at the end of the day. So I'm going to quickly go through a couple ways that you can try this out yourself. The first is sequencing. It's really important to start with ethnography and qualitative methods and to transition into sizing surveys and maybe you know, the authenticity type training survey where you're gathering more examples and to keep these feedback loops going. Data science and research and design are really you know, going after a shared goal, as we heard in Mila's talk. And it's important that we work together throughout this whole thing uh, to serve you know, the right type of content to the right people at the right time. So 
combining the two disciplines is sort of a natural overlap to building an AI system for these reasons. In measuring your impact, it's important to focus on long-term successful outcomes, showing that you're an advocate, not for growth happening, hacking, but for what's actually more important in the long run, um, ensuring that your training data maps to how people think, so those initial examples that you collect, making sure they're relevant, measuring the increased accuracy of your models. Ideally, through all of this work, you can start to see, hey, we're getting it right more of the time, and that can be attributed to a lot of the research that you've done. And then over time, just continuing to gather this information and improve with feedback loops. So I'm going to end here that working with or alongside AI can be a little intimidating, uh, especially because these people are often so quantitatively focused. And qualitative doesn't feel like as much of a method to them. But considering that everyone's sharing the same goal of making an AI feel more human, um, we can all sort of respect each other's work come together and make sure that we're uh, achieving this in the long run because it's research that has the leg up when it comes to identifying these human factors that should be accounted for in any AI system. Thank you.